はい、皆さんこんにちは私はマネック証券のハッチこと岡本平八郎です今日はよろしくお願いします今日はですね来日されましたアークインベストの創業者 CIO、CEO のキャシー・ウッドさんにお話をお伺いしたいと思いますキャシーさんのアークインベストですがこちらは2014年に設立されましたその前キャシーさんはアメリカの大手運用会社で12年ほどグローバルテーマ株式ファンドの CIO として5000億円をを超えるファンドの責任者をされていましたそのキャシーさんはダボス会議へ出席されたりですとか2016年には金融業界の女性素晴らしい貢献をした人として表彰されたりアメリカの金融業界で最も注目されている女性の一人でいらっしゃいます Hello キャティ Welcome back to Japan It's great to see you again Now we are very close to the end of the year Can you please give us the update on general market outlook for 2023? And are we going to see a new low for the market? Yes, well,、um, I think what has happened in the last few months is that the Fed is still、uh, behaving as though we have a very bad inflation problem.、Um, it wants to make sure, even though inflation is coming down, It wants to make sure that it does not uh, uh, continue into 2023.、Uh, so it has taken interest rates up to 4.5%. That's an 18 fold increase in less than one year. And、uh, we believe that、uh, it will succeed. And in fact, it may do more than、uh, take inflation down to 2%. It may take inflation down below 2% and into negative territory.、Uh, and so we believe、uh, during the next year, the Fed will、uh, respond to commodity prices, which are coming down rapidly, discounts that are occurring at the consumer level because of too much inventory, and then the third source of、uh, deflation that we're seeing. Is innovation, and innovation is associated with lower prices. So now that supply chain problems are pretty much over,、uh, we believe that innovation, like electric vehicles, those prices will start coming down. The Fed will ease,、um, and,、uh, and then innovation strategies should take hold in a big way, I would say. Although the 10 year bond yield has c a m e down a lot from October high, but innovation stocks don't seem to positively react to the falling interest rate. What do you think are going to be the catalyst to move these stocks higher, and when do you expect that to happen? Yes, we have been surprised that、uh, long term interest rates falling from Uh, 4.25% on the 10 year Treasury to 3.5%, and the fact that oil prices have been cut by nearly in half. We have been surprised that the markets are not responding.、Uh, that tells us that what the Fed is doing is causing liquidity issues and fear, and not until the Fed. Changes its rhetoric, changes the words it's using,、uh, and says, okay, I think we're there.、Uh, I think the market is waiting for that、uh, because the Fed has been much tougher, much more aggressive, and many people、uh, didn't think it would go this far. So I think the market's waiting to see the whites of the eyes. Uh, of the Fed actually saying something different and then lowering interest rates, which we think we will see in the next three to nine months. It looks as Elon Musk is more interested in running Twitter. s As one of the largest shareholders of Tesla stock, are you concerned with the recent development around Elon Musk's behavior and recent stock price movement of Tesla? What are the catalysts for Tesla next year? And based upon that, is this a time to buy? Now, how do you see the recent competitive environment for Tesla 
is the competition we are seeing, is it as expected? Any change in your thought on robotaxi um, rollout? Uh, well, Tesla has been hit hard after uh, a, a few good years of very dramatic appreciation. I do think some people are, are concerned about Twitter, about his uh, purchase of Twitter. We do not believe that uh, Elon will remain CEO of Twitter for very long. We believe he wants to bring in uh, new talent to Twitter to run it. What he wants to do right now is just be the bad guy. Uh, I think he's laid off 75% of the labor force there. So he wants, uh, he wants change and he wants it fast. Uh, and uh, when he brings the new leadership, I think he will um, not be there on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, much like SpaceX and the Boring Company and Neuralink and now Tesla, uh, Elon has, is focusing on the moats or the barriers to entry for each of these stocks. Uh, nothing has changed uh, at uh, Tesla on that front. In fact, um, we, see the, um, we see the scaling of EV manufacturing. I believe he's about to announce a new factory in Mexico that will be up in a year, and uh, up and running, that is. And we believe that uh, Tesla is moving faster than any other auto company to scale EVs. They know how to do it. We don't need Elon there anymore. They are scaling EV production. He has the right talent for that. His primary focus now at Tesla is on the robo-taxi mm -hmm. opportunity. And uh, we believe that he will roll out a robo-taxi network in by the end of 2024. He thinks he will roll it out next year, but we know uh, that Elon's time is uh, not our time. He's just trying to motivate everyone to get there faster than otherwise would be the case. And so uh, I think there's a negative, a lot of negative sentiment around Twitter, about around competition, around uh, robo-taxi being a no-go, and uh, we think each of those um, assumptions is misplaced. Uh, we see uh, Tesla scaling its manufacturing. Um, we see the robo-taxi launching in two years, and we see the competition uh, is coming and is here. But if we look at the battery technology of the competition, uh, Tesla is still three years ahead. So that if the competition wants to deliver the same range and the same performance as a, a Tesla uh, for the same price, they will have to lose money. If they want to charge a premium price, which most of them will, uh, then they will be relying on their brand, you know, the consumer demand for their brand, even though they don't have the best performing, highest range vehicles. Now, one other consideration here is if we are in a global recession, it will hurt anything cyclical, and autos are cyclical. But uh, we do believe that in recessions, innovation actually gains share. It gains traction. And so we will see Tesla's market share, electric vehicles market share, increasing relative to gas-powered vehicles. Um, so demand may be a little on the soft side for everyone, uh, but we think Tesla will gain share in that environment. And as you know, we have a five-year investment time horizon, and uh, we publish our trades every day. So we have been buying Tesla recently in, uh, our, in our public funds that uh, need to disclose their holdings every day. 
what do you see will be a catalyst for Zoom stock to start taking off? Uh, please show your thoughts on how you are envisioning stock to start going higher. Yes, uh, so Zoom uh, is a, a stock that we think is misunderstood. Many people think it is a consumer stock, a consumer-facing service, because of what happened during the COVID crisis. Instead, it is moving much more enterprise. It gave away its, its service during COVID to consumers and educators, and they are now, uh, some of them are leaving, uh, but in their place are enterprises who are paying customers. Uh, so what do we think will be the catalyst to uh, help Zoom um, take off here? One is if it's, or when, its revenue growth reaccelerates. Uh, we expect its revenue growth to reaccelerate sometime within the next few quarters uh, from single digit back into double digit territory. Uh, many people are waiting to see that. Uh, the other uh, catalyst, we think, is its, um, its relationship with Salesforce.com. It, it, it has announced some new AI chatbot products that are going to be able, and it's based on uh, a lot of information that, that Zoom has on uh, video uh, regarding people's reactions during sales calls. So the, uh, the AI chatbots are going to help salespeople um, uh, increase the velocity of their sales. Uh, I think uh, Zoom is the uh, service that does a really good job company to company. Microsoft in Teams does a very good job inside a company. As people understand that Zoom is gaining share in the enterprise, uh, I think the stock uh, will start, uh, uh, will, will have a very nice recovery. Um, many people think Zoom is a value stock now. It is selling at 11 times EBITDA, lower than the market. Uh, and so I think that if growth uh, investors do not uh, by Zoom in the short run, value investors were, will, and then the growth investor, investors will follow. Can you please share your thought on messenger RNA-based vaccines and new drug discovery potential by Pfizer and BioNTech? Can you please update your thought on Invita, a stock you mentioned uh, you liked very much two years ago? Uh, has anything changed since then? Yes. Okay, uh, mRNA, um, mRNA gave us the vaccine, and uh, Pfizer and BioNTech uh, had uh, one of the best-selling uh, vaccines. Uh, Moderna had uh, the other. Uh, and so we can see that it was effective, uh, but the questions are durability. Um, we're learning more and more about uh, these vaccines being effective for a few months and then decay in their effectiveness. Uh, so there are still questions that our analysts have about durability. Um, and the question then is, will doctors prescribe the, the, the boosters more often? Um, there's a question also about whether or not people will want that many boosters. Certainly that is in the U.S. a, a question mark. Uh, recently, uh, mRNA, uh, and this is a Moderna breakthrough, has had a breakthrough in uh, cancer. Uh, so, again, we're facing the question of durability, and uh, our analysts are, are looking through the data and parsing it uh, very carefully because in cancer, durability obviously is one of the most important uh, criteria out there. Um, so Invite is another name in the portfolio. Our conviction, despite the stock price during the last, year, uh, last two years, our conviction has not diminished that Invite 
along with exact sciences uh, in the public markets and then freenome in the private markets, that they are going to be three of the most important players who have uh, combined uh, sequencing data uh, with artificial intelligence most effectively in order to figure out uh, uh, not only um, what is mutating in a person's genome and how it might be setting up for disease person by person, but also will help in the selection of therapies for that person. So this is what we call personalized uh, therapies or precision therapies, which is the, a huge breakthrough. Uh, about, well, 20 years ago, uh, there was the dream of personalized medicine, precision therapies. That was part of the tech and telecom bubble in the late 90s. That was the dream. It took more than 20 years to, for that dream to become a reality. So it's a becoming a reality now, and it will benefit all three companies. In terms of Invite specifically, Invite was investing probably the most aggressively of all three uh, relative to its revenue base. And uh, it, given the way the market has evolved, this concern about cash and cash flow, it was, uh, uh, it has been um, hurt in the market significantly. Uh, as a result, Sean George, who is a co-founder, um, has stepped aside as CEO and uh, named his, he, he chose his successor, a person who was at Amazon for years. Uh, and really understands big data. And so this person has streamlined the number of projects they're involved with. Focus, focus, focus is, is the new mantra. And uh, we think he has uh, focused on the biggest ideas in precision therapies and personalized medicine. So our conviction in its positioning has not diminished. It's unfortunate that the market has forced uh, Invite to cut back on some of its programs, uh, but there is something to be said about focus, focus, focus. So we think they're going to be a big winner in the space. Please give us your advice as to um, how to select growth stocks in biosector. Uh, perhaps there is no easy answer, but I appreciate if you could share uh, your way of uh, selecting them in the biosector. Yes, uh, so the selection of uh, stocks within the biotech area um, is a function of our research, and we're looking for, for uh, something specifically. Um, we're looking for technologically enabled innovators, those who are changing the way we uh, address healthcare using scientific knowledge like DNA sequencing to understand where mutations are. Uh, we're also looking uh, for more than just one technology. So sequencing is a very important technology, but artificial intelligence is just as important, in fact, maybe more important in healthcare than in any other sector. Because for the first time, uh, we're, be, we're able to isolate where the mutations or programming errors are in people's genomes as they get older. As they get older, they have more programming errors, more, uh, more mutations. Uh, now we can isolate them in the six billion bits of code in our genome. It was not possible before. So we are looking for companies that are focused on this convergence between sequencing and artificial intelligence, as well as gene editing. Uh, so you'll find a lot of gene editing stocks in our portfolio. You'll find molecular diagnostic testing companies in our portfolio, 
And of course, you'll find therapeutic companies. Uh, of course, gene editing is a, a therapy these days. It's not just a technology. Uh, so that's how the names arrive in our portfolio. Another big uh, position in the portfolio is Teladoc. And that is the convergence of that company is trying to build out the healthcare information backbone in the United States and then in other countries. And so it has access to millions and upon millions of people's genomic data. And it will protect privacy, everything's anonymous, but it's able to use that data um, with artificial intelligence to recommend therapies and to diagnose diseases. Uh, many people think of Teladoc as a, a telemedicine stock that only was going to perform in the coronavirus era. Mm. We disagree entirely. Uh, it is building the most important, one of the most important genomic databases to enable personalized medicine uh, in the world. There are many areas of innovation, but what do you believe is the area of innovation that will grow most in 10, uh, 20 years of investment horizon in terms of total addressable market? Okay. Yes, uh, so in our Big Ideas 2022, <clears throat> we, we showed the building blocks of how we expect truly disruptive innovation to scale from what is now really only six or seven trillion dollars in the global equity markets, so cut in half in the last two years. So from six to seven trillion dollars to $210 trillion, so from less than 10% of the global equity market cap to more than 60% of the global equity market cap. And the biggest contributor uh, was AI. I think uh, m uh, more than half of that uh, growth it was from AI. Well, guess what? This year, we have seen more breakthroughs in AI than, than we expected for the next five to 10 years. And so uh, we think that the opportunity, that 210 trillion, will be much higher. Uh, now, why is this? Well, as we also documented last year, AI training costs are coming down 60% per year. Uh, and the creativity in the industry is booming. So now with text prompts, a person can say through Dolly 2, a program out there, I want to draw myself in all of the sports uniforms possible in the world. Uh, and uh, Dolly 2 does it in a few minutes. And it looks like an artist did it. If an artist did that, it would take $150 to $300, very conservatively, uh, and it would have taken hours of time. Dolly, Dolly 2 does it in seconds, minutes, uh, for a few pennies. Uh, so uh, uh, several yen. Uh, so it's astonishing that this can happen. and. Uh, many, many people are worried, oh goodness, what's going to happen to these designer jobs, these creator jobs? Uh, we think it's going to improve because their cost just dropped. They can get uh, a baseline and then they can build on top, make it much better, bring their human expertise in. So that's exciting. And then in another realm, and this is for knowledge workers, all knowledge workers, um, you, with chat GPT-3, uh, which is a, a subset of GPT-3, uh, we can, uh, again, using a text prompt, prompt say, um, please write the history of space exploration. And uh, within a few seconds, boom, 
history, beautiful essay. And uh, so what's interesting about that is many people are saying, what is going to happen now? How are we going to educate students if they can just go to chat GPT and say, write an essay? Uh, well, the answer is they have to be careful because uh, on the internet, there are all kinds of facts and figures about space exploration, but there's a lot of misinformation and there's also a lot of creative content, fiction, people's imaginations talking about space exploration. And so this essay is a, a function of all of those. And so a lot of it's wrong. A lot of it's just wrong. And the citations are, don't exist. And so a student is going to have to fact check uh, essays if he or she wants chat GPT to do their homework. And they'll probably spend more time checking the facts and learning more than they would writing the essay in the first place. So very exciting. Uh, we think that 210 trillion, and think about it, that's thir that right there is 30 times where we are right now. Uh, we think that's going higher. And so what we're also saying is that the growth rates associated with AI and anything that AI touches, and it touches all of our other innovation platforms, whether it's sequencing or robotics, energy storage as well, uh, and uh, uh, let's see, energy storage, oh, and blockchain technology. We believe AI will converge with blockchain technology as well. So uh, it's a very big idea, and those growth rates are going to increase. They're going to accelerate, and they were already very high in the 30 to 50 percent range. Now they're going higher. And this is what most uh, critics of our strategy don't believe. And they don't believe it because they're not doing the first principles research that we are. And we're following every breakthrough in AI. And we already had a point of view uh, as to when that breakthrough would happen, five, 10 years. It's happening in six months. It's amazing. And yet, because of the macro backdrop, the market, which has, uh, in a risk-off period, looking at just one quarter, um, it's not looking out into the future, so it cannot see these growth rates. What are some of the growth stock candidates that may exceed the market cap of Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta, um, would they come from outside the U.S.? Oh, and I do. So in terms of, in terms of what are the next trillion dollar ideas, we've, we've uh, been introduced to this idea of trillion dollar market caps by Microsoft and Apple and at one point Facebook and, and, other, and other fangs. Um, and, uh, and yet we see they are being disrupted. So who are the new trillion dollar companies? Well, uh, one of them still is Tesla. Tesla, I believe, touched a trillion dollars and has come back down. Tesla is one of our biggest ideas uh, because it uh, is probably in the best position uh, for the robo-taxi platform opportunity, which we believe will, uh, will generate uh, eight to ten trillion dollars in revenue, not market cap, revenue uh, during the next eight to ten years. Uh, and, and those margins are going to be very high. They are SaaS-like margins. Uh, SaaS-like uh, robo-taxi margins are in the 80 percent range. EV margins, that's gross margins, uh, are in the 25 to 30 percent range. So that's a big increase going forward. And we have proof of concept. Um, uh, cruise automation, which is uh, uh, the autonomous division of GM, uh, has a robo-taxi. Uh, and I took a ride in it with Tasha Kini a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, actually. And it was flawless. It was amazing. So we know it's possible. 
but we know that Tesla has two competitive advantages. The AI chip, the only company with an AI chip, and more data, orders of magnitude more data than all of the rest of the auto companies in the world put together. Uh, so big competitive advantage there. And as, fact, as far as other $1 trillion opportunities, I think every stock in our top 10 has a trillion dollar potential. And one of the reasons is data is the new, is the new oil. Data is the new oil, <clears throat> proprietary data. These AI uh, projects that I just described to you are all open source. They, they're given away, they're free. What is going to uh, determine success, commercial success in artificial intelligence is proprietary data. And that's what we're looking for in our companies. They have data that no one else has. And they have a lot of it, and it's important data. So uh, there are many companies that have data just for their own company that no one has, but it, that doesn't matter as much as having data on you know, global consumers and global enterprises that nobody else has. And so we think most of the stocks in our top 10 are going to scale to trillion dollar opportunities because AI opportunities are tend to be winner take most. The companies with the best data, uh, the best domain uh, expertise, and the best AI expertise are going to win a disproportionate share of the market. Can you please share your current thought on Metaverse? Yes, the Metaverse, I think we're seeing a lot of early disappointment. Mm. Uh, uh, certainly from uh, Meta Platform, the former Facebook, um, anything that causes friction uh, in, in terms of the metaverse, like the headsets do, um, is, is going to have to improve dramatically and almost be seamless, just become a pair of glasses uh, before we think metaverse the way that, uh, the immersive way that uh, Meta Platforms has um, uh, uh, has planned for it. Um, instead, what do we see in Metaverse today? Um, you can say Zoom was the first Metaverse, and we learned all about it during COVID. Uh, we were all in the Metaverse experiencing each other, either uh, in conversation or uh, or on a video talking about business. Um, and what we learned is that maybe avatars aren't exactly the way to go. We need much more human-like features so that we can look at the facial expressions and discern what people mean. Now, avatars will probably become very human-like over time, but right now they're not. And so... We are still very excited about the metaverse. We think it started. Zoom was a good start. NFTs, another good start. And we think uh, that digital property rights uh, are become, uh, will become the most important part of the metaverse. But we are in very, very early days. What made you to sell uh, Palantir technology stocks? Uh, are you no longer interested in the company? Yes. Um, well, Palantir, uh, we, we love what Palantir has done in terms of advancing the state of the art in artificial intelligence and applying it to national security. Uh, we think it's been a very important company that way. What concerned us about Palantir uh, was when we learned that the Biden administration, it had come in and it was making decisions uh, that uh, uh, meant that Palantir would not have access to all of the data that it used to have access to because the administration wanted uh, more to dual source. It didn't want to be dependent on one company. And in fact, it's invited many companies in to help with national security. Well, when you break up data like that, 
you're taking away a competitive advantage. Uh, and that was Palantir's competitive advantage. Uh, government was more than, well, more than half, 60% plus of Palantir's business. So we thought that it would be hurt by this and that it would have to work even harder in the uh, private space to build its business. So it's a big transition, and the government's very important to it. Uh, so we will always have an open mind. It has some of the best uh, talent in AI in the world. Uh, but once the government made its decision, some of that talent left. So we're seeing Palantir talent starting other companies. Uh, and that is, uh, that is a, another problem, short term for Palantir, that we know it will get over, but it may take some time. Can you please uh, refresh your views on Bitcoin? And uh, what would trigger the market to start refocusing on Bitcoin? Well, I do believe the market is starting to refocus on Bitcoin because of all of the crises in crypto this year. The crises were caused by centralized companies that were not transparent. They were opaque, uh, whether we're talking about Celsius or uh, Three Arrows Capital, 3AC, uh, or FTX, uh, and maybe even Genesis and uh, Digital Currency Group. Um, those, those companies, all centralized, not transparent. If you looked at what happened on uh, the blockchains when Terra Luna um, really uh, disintegrated, uh, what you see is on the b transparent blockchains, margin calls were satisfied uh, because they, they happened first, right away, and they're smart contracts, they're automatic, no human intervention there. Meanwhile, you had Celsius and 3AC and other hedge funds, FTX, uh, uh, an exchange, uh, all figuring out how do we get through this? They weren't being transparent. They weren't, uh, they were pretending they were very strong. Uh, and so the, the people who had money with them lost all their money. Um, so the power of Bitcoin is, it is the most decentralized uh, financial network out there. And it is completely transparent. Uh, and I think this is a replay of 0809 in the traditional financial services world. The centralized organizations that weren't transparent uh, because they couldn't be, they didn't know where the counterparties were with all of these derivatives, they seized up and the government had to intervene. You'll notice there's been no government intervention on Bitcoin. There doesn't have to be. It's decentralized, transparent, and that is a selling point. Those are two very big selling points for Bitcoin and, to some extent, Ethereum, uh, because most of the smart contract work is taking place on Ethereum. So our confidence in both of them has gone up, and uh, we are staying away from the centralized, non-transparent players. Are you interested in finding out innovative companies in emerging and frontier markets? Uh, yes, we're always looking for innovation no matter where it is. Uh, right now we have a disproportionate uh, percentage of our portfolio in, in the U.S. However, after, during and after COVID, uh, we saw China uh, reacting in a very disciplined and responsible way from a monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, point of view. And we liked that. We thought that was very good. And so we uh, diversified our portfolio. We usually concentrate during risk-off periods and then diversify during risk-on periods. And uh, we took our flagship uh, portfolio to somewhere in the 20 to 25% range 
in China and Asia stocks generally, and emerging stock emerging markets, including Latin America, even higher. Um, but then, uh, then we had the political problems evolve in China, starting with Ant Financial, uh, the crackdown, and Jack Ma, uh, gaming, online education, crypto mining. Uh, all of this innovation has been uh, shut down uh, in the interest of common prosperity. And so we think this means uh, that companies with very low profit margins will we'll probably do fine if they are helping uh, Tier 3, Tier 4 cities. Uh, but uh, innovation, we think, is going to, um, it, it won't stop. It just won't be on the leading edge in China anymore because the incentives are not there. So we have pulled away in our flagship strategy from, uh, from uh, China in particular. We are. Uh, we have started a new strategy. It's a pub public-private strategy, and um, one of the important names in there is African. It's a an African digital wallet. Uh, we have Safaricom in various of our funds as well. Um, Chipper Cash is um, is cross-country in in Africa. That's very unusual whereas Safaricom was primarily Kenya. Um, and so this, is a ver this, this company is using uh, crypto as well as artificial intelligence and really taking a lot of learning from U.S. tech because the CEO and uh, top management came out of Google and Meta and other companies. Uh, so that's a very interesting company, and we do think that when uh, the currency crisis stops, meaning the dollar stops going up, we don't know, it's starting to come down, but we have to be sure, when the dollar uh, starts settling down and seems like it will stay that way, we will be much more interested in emerging markets and frontier currencies. Uh, in the last year, two years, the Fed's uh, tightening relative to other countries in the world has hurt emerging and frontier markets. We see in Sri Lanka and Pakistan the riots and because they're losing their purchasing power, they're losing their wealth. So it has been a very dangerous period, uh, but we are tiptoeing back in, uh, starting with our private, public-private fund, which of course those private funds, will, funds will, or companies will go public one day. Are there new companies that you started invest recently? Well, it, in the last two years, since February of 21, uh, because of rising inflation and interest rate fears and then the reality, um, we have used the down round in innovation to concentrate our portfolios towards our highest conviction names. And so we haven't been, we haven't had the big rally. When we see the big rally, and we do believe uh, with inflation and interest rates coming down, we are close. Um, we will then, we'll let our portfolios run for a while, appreciate, and then we'll start to diversify again. First, in new names, uh, probably IPOs that are finally coming out of companies in the private sector that that we've been monitoring. Uh, and then as time goes on, we will add more cash-like innovation names. This is maybe two years from now, uh, which are going to be more liquid and will give us more opportunity to move in the portfolio when we see opportunities. Uh, so right now, um, we're concentrating and we're pretty much where we want to be. Um, that said, I've mentioned how exciting the opportunities are in the convergence of artificial intelligence um, uh, with everything in every sector and in every innovation platform. So we're really paying a lot of uh, attention to the kind of data that companies have across the board, how proprietary it is and how important it is and how much companies are thinking about activating it with artificial intelligence and creating really special new products and services. So I'd say that's what we're thinking about the most. Lastly, Akati, 
Do you have any message to your fans in Japan who believes in disruptive innovation investment? Yes, um, to to those wonderful people in uh, in Japan who have uh, stuck with our strategies and in Asia generally, actually, um, we've had incredible reception on this trip, and we're grateful for that. Uh, grateful for the belief in our research, and I think the reason we've had such great retention is our research. Uh, our uh, the people who love our strategies, love our research, love learning about the way the world is going to work, not the way it has worked, uh, and believe that we are the right strategies for the future, because even the former disruptors, like the FANGs, they are getting disrupted, and that means that investors need to look at new companies, and our companies are the new companies. Uh, and the other thing I will say is, during bear markets, our strategies tend to bottom before the market does. And uh, the reason is, uh, they are the new leadership. They're always the new leadership. Innovation is always the new leadership. And so uh, I think that's the other, uh, the other positive we can focus on right now. We, because inflation rates are coming down, and because we believe they will drop below 2%, we believe the Fed will be easing, our strategies were punished the most, and they should be rewarded the most as time goes on and uh, we get back to the future. Thank you so much for meeting us in your busy schedule today. Hope to meet you again soon.